Hi there! This is Megan with Lutherian Fiber Arts. On this channel, I focus primarily on fiber, but today I wanted to overview another area of sheep science, soap making. Now, I don't usually talk about animals as food, so if this is a difficult topic for you, I recommend checking out one of our other videos about fiber preparation instead. I know that discussing where food and products come from can be a sensitive topic, and I want to approach that conversation respectfully. Let me start with a story. A friend of mine, Joanna, and her farm, Wildflower Acres, keep a very small flock of Corydale sheep, which she breeds with the dual purpose of fiber and meat, uh, mainly for her own family. Having personally visited, I can confirm that these sheep are well-loved and well-cared for. I've gotten many fleeces from her, including from Holiday the Sheep, who was featured in my article in the Corydale and Bond issue of Ply Magazine. Last year, she sold us one of her rams for meat. Our family likes to know where our food comes from, and we also try to use as much of the animal as possible to honor its life. Beyond bone broth and sausages, I tried to delve into what it means to use the whole animal. Now, depending on the butcher company, when a sheep or cow is butchered, the fat that surrounds the organs, which that's called the suet, is usually not given back to the customer unless requested. These are part of the scraps and are often sold off very cheaply to rendering companies that use them in pet foods. Suet is a great source of collagen and has loads of essential vitamins, so it's great for our carnivore companions, but we can also put that fat to work in our own homes if we want to. Now, suet can be used directly in cooking or it can be rendered into tallow, which is the pure form of the fat. Tallow can be used in cooking, it has a high smoke point, it can be used in skin care as well, and it can also be used to make soap. It's one of the most useful parts of the animal. Now, rendering tallow is surprisingly easy, though it is a kind of a smelly process, I'm not gonna lie. When I received the bag of suet along with my meat, I put it into the freezer with everything else. Frozen fat is easier to handle, and when I was ready to render, I trimmed off any meat that was still attached to the fat. It didn't have to be perfect, but a little work early in the process makes lighter work near the end. I then chopped the fat into small pieces. Some people use a food processor, I just gave mine a fine chop with a knife. Again, frozen fat makes this process way easier and way cleaner. The next step is to heat the fat. I used a crock pot and placed it outside on the patio. Again, rendering fat has a strong smell that it's not exactly pleasant and it can frankly be overwhelming. I set it on low for eight hours and cooked it until the brown cracklings are left in the clear fat. Cracklings are all the little bits of meat and sinew and stuff that isn't fat. Um, this fat mixture is then filtered to separate the cracklings from the fat. I strained mine using a metal strainer lined with several layers of cheesecloth into some freezer paper lined glass containers. Cracklins can be saved and added to biscuits or eggs. They add great flavor and texture to a dish. Um, they can sometimes be used in lieu of bacon. So I always save the cracklins as well. Once the rendered fat cools completely, I remove the hardened fat from the molds, wrap it in freezer paper, place it in a Ziploc bag, and pop it back into the freezer to use later. Tallow can be stored at room temperature, but I use mine pretty infrequently and it makes sense for me to freeze it. Um, I like to freeze it in 10 ounce bricks that I can thaw one at a time as needed. A strange new movement has people all over the world reducing or foregoing traditional shampoo. Good evening, this is Bill O'Gruffy coming to you, live from Goat Nightly News. The tin can stops here. It's called the no poo movement, and while it sounds like a poorly timed bathroom joke, it has more to do with our heads than our butts. No poo means no shampoo. Some humans want to avoid overly stripping their hair of good oils produced by the scalp. Others want to use fewer unnatural chemicals in their daily routines. And for some people, no poo means rejecting the commercial pressure to spend more money on hygiene than may actually be necessary. 
While the purest followers of the no poo method use only water to wash their hair, giving up shampoo doesn't mean you have to give up showers or washing your hair altogether. Instead of shampoo, people who've adopted this hair care technique may use baking soda followed by apple cider vinegar, or only use conditioner. You can even buy products off the shelf that cleanse your hair but are technically not shampoo. And some people are opting for a low poo method in which hair is washed with shampoo less frequently, or with alternatives, like bar soaps. For those of us in the animal kingdom, the no poo method hardly seems like news. But in countries like the United States, where the culture promotes showering every day, self-proclaimed no pooers offer a stark alternative to this obsessive bathing. This may be the culture shock we need. Back to you, Megan. Thanks, Bill. I personally like to take the low poo route with my own hair, and I love to use my own handmade sheep tallow soap to keep it looking shiny and clean. Now that we've got our tallow, we can move on to making our soap. I'm going to throw a big word at you. Saponification. Saponification is the chemical process of making soap that involves the exothermic reaction between lye, which is sodium hydroxide, and a fat, which is composed of triglycerides. The chemical reaction with the lye converts that into two other things, glycerin and soap. With that in mind, remember that making soap is more of a science than an art. It's important to get your ratios of lye to fats right. If you use too much lye, there will be lye left over that isn't used during the chemical reaction, which means that your soap could chemically burn you. That also means mind your safety. You should always wear gloves and long sleeves when handling lye. Likewise, eye protection and a respirator mask. Keep vinegar or water nearby to quickly flush the lye if it comes in contact with skin. And always add your lye to the water, not the other way around. Never add water to lye. Adding water to lye can cause the lye to expand and erupt out of the container. Also, work outdoors or in a well-ventilated area and respect your tools and ingredients, friends. Now, there are tons of tallow soap recipes available. My favorite recipe is one that I use as a shampoo bar, body soap, and hand soap. It leaves a small amount of the oils unsaponified, which is really great for hair and skin health. You'll see the ingredients on the screen, but you can find the full recipe in the description below. These quantities are enough to fill one of my 44 ounce soap molds with maybe a little bit of soap left over. In a crock pot or double boiler, melt the tallow, coconut oil, olive oil, and castor oil. Allow it to cool to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. In a separate glass or heat-resistant plastic container, add your lye slowly into your pre-measured water and stir it very carefully. Avoid using a metal container as lye can react with some metals. When the lye hits the water, it's going to create an exothermic reaction. This means that the lye mixture will become very hot very quickly. It can take room temperature water to 200 degrees Fahrenheit in less than a minute. It'll start out cloudy and it'll slowly turn clear as it combines. This is one of the reasons why it's so important to take safety seriously. I allow the lye mixture to cool for 10 to 15 minutes. Once the temperature of the oils and the temperature of the lye are correct, I add the lye mixture into the oil mixture and use an immersion blender to fully combine the oil and lye. Once the two meet, the saponification process starts and more heat is generated. That's one of the reasons why we let our oils cool down. I keep those gloves on and avoid coming in contact with it at this point. As it begins to thicken, I add any scented oils or soap dyes that I want to use. And while it's still the consistency of runny pudding, I pour the soap into the mold. I top it with freezer paper to help keep from making a mess, and then I wrap the mold in a towel, and that helps hold in the heat and slow down the cooling process. The saponification process will continue for the next 24 to 48 hours as the lye and fat is converted into soap. At the 24 hour mark, the soap has hardened enough to remove from the mold and to cut. Technically speaking, you can use your soap after a few days, 
but it's better if you let it cure for four to eight weeks. This allows residual moisture to evaporate and the soap becomes harder and will last longer when used. I line up my bars on a tray covered in freezer paper and I put it in a room where it won't be bothered. In my case, it's the sunroom. Uh, that way the soap doesn't permeate my whole house. Of course, cleanup is super easy. I mean, it's soap, it washes right off. And then when the soap is ready to go, I use it as an alternative to shampoo and body soap. From one ram, I got between 60 to 70 ounces of tallow, and this was enough for six full batches of soap easily. Uh, this is way more than I could use myself in one year. If you do decide to make soap, play around with different recipes, find one that works for you. Don't be afraid to experiment, but always be safety conscious. Do your research and respect your tools and materials. Sheep tallow is incredibly versatile. Thank you for joining me today. You can find out more information on Fiber Arts on our YouTube page or at our website, www.luthvarian.com. You can find my articles in both Ply and Spinoff magazines. And make sure that you smash that like button and that you're subscribed to the channel for more great fiber art tips. Thanks.